thank you for coming back. So uh, two small things like that people can arrive if they are late. So first, a small erratum. So yesterday you saw that I was kind of confused about why I was getting a to the 2 minus d and then a to the d plus 2 over 2. But I mean, it was completely stupid of mine, of me, because I mean, if you take your discrete Schwinger uh, state, I mean, a function, indeed here you need maybe a renormalization delta a that this converges to the continuum 1. And indeed, if you look at the, um, the function, the, the, the average of, of, uh, of phi a against a function f, maybe you also need a renormalization here. But I mean, they have, of course, nothing. I mean, they are not directly related to each other. I don't know why I wanted them to be equal. I mean, they are directly related to each other, but they are not equal. So let me just mention what would be actually fairly obvious to see. So if this you want it to converge to something like that, the natural relation between the two here is that delta of a should be a to the 2d times capital delta of a. This uh, and, uh, uh, and the square root of that. So that's completely normal that I was not getting the same thing. In fact, I mean, this delta of a here was blowing up even, was not even going to zero. So I don't know why I thought, OK, is it d plus 2, d minus 2? Um, my, my brain snapped. So it was indeed uh, here, in our case, it was a to the 2 minus d. And this guy was a to the d plus 2 over 2, which was uh, the thing that OK, that was just to correct this mistake. And now let me rewrite this because this is the main theorem, so I'm just going to rewrite it here. The triviality theorem that is saying so that if you consider the nearest neighbor, so this you don't need to rewrite. It's exactly what I wrote yesterday. So consider the nearest neighbor ferromagnetic easing model on Z4. Then there exists a constant. C, which is universal. I mean, we would even we could even have an explicit formula, but it's not that interesting. Such that whatever beta smaller or equal to beta c, whatever l smaller or equal to the correlation length psi of beta, whatever the function f, which is smooth or continuous, compactly supported. Then I have a bound on how much the characteristic function of the random variable TFL sigma, how much it differs from what I would get if it was a normal random variable. Oh, sorry, FL of sigma squared beta. So minus 1 is smaller than a constant that depends on f, z to the 4 over log l to the c, and this is true for every z positive. OK? So this is just a theorem that will actually be the object of the class from now on. And I made a small comment, but this was only the first comment among many others, so let me put remarks with an S. So first remark is that it basically says that this thing is like a normal random variable of the right variance. That's the first thing. A second thing that was asked for me is that I mean, the question that, that people ask me is that here it looked not so great when beta is very small. You could have a doubt that this is true. But remember that this is only interesting because L must be smaller than psi of beta when L is larger and larger. 
beta has to be closer and closer to, to beta c. OK, so it's very much, it is a result dealing with beta near beta c. Really. So don't bother about what happens far away from the critical point. Third comment is that here, I am making one assumption which is not so natural, which is this one here. I'm asking that beta is smaller or equal to beta c. So the assumption that this is true should not actually be important. It should be that, I mean, should not matter. But in our case, it's, it's technically important to deal with the fact that if beta was strictly larger than beta c, the spontaneous magnetization will be strictly positive. Should not matter, but technically, but technically, uh, so, but technically it is, uh, it is more convenient. Because otherwise, so what happens when you are above the critical point? Well, you should subtract the spontaneous magnetization. You should work with truncated correlation. As beta larger than beta c would require to deal with typically, so for instance, if you define S A x1, x2, let's say beta. So below the critical point, it was simply something like that. But if you are above the critical point, you should add minus magnetization, spontaneous magnetization squared. It doesn't mean that the result become wrong. In fact, they should still be right. But the techniques that we are going to develop, so far, I mean, they should also be the right techniques to deal with this, but technically we don't manage to do it. And in fact, you are, you are going to see during the lectures that I will explain to you how you do it in higher dimension, dimension five and more. You can also extend this, which is actually related maybe to the next comment. So in dimension d larger than four, one has a similar result. This time, L to the D minus 4 replaces log L to the C. So you get an error which is even smaller. Here, the decay is very fast. And this is a result, a very famous result by Eisenman. in 1980, and by Frölich independently the same year. So this is actually much simpler to prove, the higher dimension case. Well, even for the higher dimension case, we don't know currently how to treat the beta larger than beta c. So just to say that there is something about working with truncated correlation that is not that easy. And uh, we have experts in the room of people who try to work on, uh, on easing in above the critical point, And these correlations, they, they are not so easy to, to handle. So here, it's a typical example where, where things uh, really uh, don't work well. So a comment that I made, I mean, that somebody asked me. Yes? So if beta is greater than beta c, then uh, you can choose different boundary conditions or ten different? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean. You, you, well, you don't need here. You can also do that even with free. Otherwise, you could also take plus boundary condition or minus. So you could take different boundary condition if you wish. Yeah. If you take plus boundary condition, then your variables inside have a mean, which is non-zero anymore, which is m star of beta. So then 
you should look at sigma x minus m star of beta as being your variable at each point. Okay. And then you do a smear average of that. Yeah. And you would expect indeed that you still get something uh, that is going to converge. And that you should also get something trivial. So always get something Gaussian, but we don't know how to prove. Um, yeah, so it was a comment that somebody made about this assumption. So if L is much lar larger than psi of beta, in fact, the result is still true in some sense. It's just that uh, the sigma, I mean, the limiting, the limits one can get are just white noise. So you get a Gaussian process, except that just the covariance is zero for any uh, point that are not equal. Uh, OK. Yes? Your beta c, does it depend on L? No, no, no. This is the beta c of the nearest neighbor using model. Ah, on the four. Yeah, I see. OK. If you, well, I will come back to that uh, just after. But once you look at all the 5-4 models, each lattice 5-4 model has its own beta c. That depends on the parameter. Already, already yeah, it's already infinite size. You could do it in finite size, but it doesn't uh, change uh, typically. So here we already took the r go to infinity cutoff, basically. OK, so. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so in your definition of uh, responded to TFR, you, you were scaled by some stereotype yeah. sigma. Yeah. So, suppose we are at, at the critical point, and uh, at this, so far we don't know the, crit, uh, the scaling dimension of sigma, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah but then, if, if sigma is greater than d over 2, so is it possible that the sigma L is too large that it kills the. Well, whatever, uh, I mean, what could be is that there is no convergence, meaning that for some f, mm -hmm. then TFL is, uh, of sigma is a nice random variable, and for other f, it's just zero, and for other f, it blows up. That's possible. But as soon as you want that TFL of sigma is non-trivial for some kind of nice function, then sigma L is the only thing you can imagine. Because, OK, so let me, maybe I'm going to add a remark like that. So just sigma L in the notation that I used, this is just the variance of T indicator function of minus 1 to the D, L of sigma. This is just that. Sigma L of, uh, of beta is this. So of course, this is not a compactly supported continuous function. Okay? But because this, if you expand, right, it's, a, the, it's the integral or it's the sum uh, over x and y of uh, f of x, f of y times the correlation. And the correlations are positive. So if you take any function f, if you take f, say, compactly supported in, in minus 1, 1 to the d. Let's just simplify like that. I don't take minus r, r, but minus 1, 1 to the d. Then, by definition, when you are going to look at t f l of sigma squared, it's going to be smaller than norm of f infinity squared times sigma L of beta if you don't renormalize. If you would not be, uh, OK, this is not renormalized, it's just some uh, non-renormalized. So you see that you clearly want to be divided by this thing to get something bounded. And same thing on the other side, if f is non-trivial on a small minus epsilon epsilon square, uh, minus epsilon epsilon to the d box, then you get the bound on the other side with the same sigma L. So it's really, it's really the right normalization. And at least for positive function, if you renormalize like that, you end up with a random variable which has a variant. So it's a centered random variable, and it has a non-trivial variance. 
which, which is uh, the most reasonable thing to, to try. OK. Um, OK, so I keep going. So seventh comment. So it generalizes. to 5-4 lattice models. So in this 5-4 lattice model, remember that there was a beta, a b, and a lambda parameter. So what it will be is that for every lambda positive and every b, this is true if you take beta smaller than the beta c lambda b, which is the critical parameter of the 5-4 lattice model. Remember that 5-4s look like easing models, so they also have a critical parameter that depends on lambda and b. And the result will be true as long as beta is below this critical parameter. But in the case of 5-4 models, it has the following uh, consequence is that imagine, so definition. So I wrote 1.6, but I'm absolutely not sure this is the right numerotation. But, um, what you can say is that a family of 5-4 lattice models, let's say indexed by n, converges to the random distribution phi if, so let's say the parameters uh, index by n, so here I could say that the parameters are, uh, so there is this lambda n, which is going to be the parameter lambda, the bn. I'm also allowed to vary beta n as long as I satisfy this thing. They are defined on a lattice of mesh size, mesh size a n. In fact, I would even have normally the big size Rn, but let's forget about that. So there are all these parameters. I'm allowed to choose them as I want, as long as beta n is smaller than the beta c of lambda n and bn. So here, the only thing is that I want this to be smaller than beta c of lambda n bn. OK, so I said that this family of four lattice model converges to the random distribution phi if for every f uh, smooth and compactly supported. Epsilon n times t f uh, 1 over a n of phi n converges in low to tf of phi. OK, so it's really I gave myself all the freedom. I'm allowed to choose all the parameters as I want, even the normalization. It's just that I want this to be converging for every f. In this case, I say that the second of family converges to phi. Well, what the generalization of this result to 5-4 lattice model gives is that any, so in dimension 4, any phi which is the limit of 5-4 lattice model is a generalized Gaussian process in the sense, let me just remind you, in the sense that Tf1 of phi, Tfk of phi, is Gaussian.
OK? So really, you cannot construct a non-Gaussian random distribution in dimension 4 using the 5-4 lattice models. Again, this is one way of proceeding. It's a priori not the only one. So I would say that this is an extremely strong indication that whatever the cutoff you will do to try to construct phi 4 on R, so, so it's R valued, you will get something trivial. So you, in order to construct something, you would probably need to use uh, non-commutative uh, non spins or something like that, because at least with the phi 4 lattice model on R, you will probably fail. OK, I keep going with my comments. Um, and it will be the last one, and then we dive to the second, uh, into the second part of the, of the lectures, is that, so as you saw, the five dimension and more, I did D strictly larger than four, because if you do long range model, you can actually mimic a model with non-integer value, and there you could also prove that it's trivial. But I mean, if you take nearest neighbor, then you need to speak about D larger or equal to five. So as I said, in the 80s, it was proved that the thing is trivial. So I should, comp so, and then it took 40 years to have the nearest neighbor easing model on Z4. But let me complete this by a story, which is that there are cases for which it was known in four dimension that you have something trivial. So when lambda is much smaller than one, in some sense, you are looking at a 5-4 model that looks very much, that is quite close to a Gaussian process, which would be lambda equals 0. So then you have renormalization, I should say, rigorous renormalization arguments Uh, were used to prove convergence, to prove a massive GFF scaling limit. When I say massive, I include, I also include zero mass. Meaning that there you could even prove that this converges really to what you get when you look at a continuous massive Gaussian free fit. Um, so these renormalization arguments, let me mention two teams. So the first one on the Gavetsky, Kupi, Einan are, uh, there is too many Ds here. What do you have? Gavetsky, Kupi, Einan already in the 80s. They used a rigorous renormalization scheme that is based on uh, a rigorous version of Kadanov block spin renormalization. So a rigorous block spin. So a la Kadanov, if you want. And this was in the 80s. More recently, there was a, a team, including Bayer Schmidt. Bridges and Slade that got the same results and then extended it to larger, I mean, to Rn instead of R for the value of the spins. Where there, the idea, the idea is a little bit different, is that you write, in some sense, your phi four model in terms of the GFF, of the discrete GFF that you would end up with if you would just set lambda equal zero. And then you decompose this, the covariance of this uh, GFF in terms of, of uh, in a multi-scale uh, fashion, and you integrate out the modes there, and you, you, you keep track just of how the spin-spin, for instance, behave, and quantities like that. So it's a very uh, powerful uh, strategy that is a little bit different from the more physical one that you see here. So here it's more of a decomposition. So express expression of the phi 4 lattice model 
in terms of an underlying GFF plus multiscale decomposition of the GFF. There are many other ways of proceeding, but I just wanted to mention these two, uh, these two ways. But the important thing about them is that they are really perturbative in nature. They work because you start from something close to um, your, uh, your uh, Gaussian process. So if I, if I think of the lambda, like the larger the lambda, when b is fixed, here I have a discrete massive GFF. It's a very nice Gaussian process, etc., etc. And if you start close enough, so this guy, when you, you renormalize, when you look at a tends to 0, it converges to a fixed point, which is a massive GFF in the limit. So if you start nearby here, you will also converge to the same thing. OK? That's what this renormalization argument says. Now, if you want to be playing the devil advocate, what you will clearly see, I mean, so it's beautiful results. They, they, they give very delicate estimates. So, uh, you, you get a lot of information on the models. But if you want to play the devil advocate, you will say, but of course, if I want to be building a 5-4 uh, uh, field theory, which is non-trivial, then I would like to be starting as far as possible from the Gaussian process. So that means starting rather that way, as far as possible. And actually, lambda tending to infinity is what? It's easing. So in some sense, easing is far there. And it is the furthest away from this thing. That's why I stated it my theorem in this context, because in some sense, it's what is the farthest away. And this, this uh, renormalization argument, which are perturbative, in some sense, they complement very well, but we are speaking about almost different worlds. Here, it's you start in the vicinity of a fixed point, and you prove that you converge to the fixed point. What I'm saying is that if you start from anywhere, even very far, you will always get to something Gaussian. By the way, uh, this is going to be comment 9. One expects that it's more than just Gaussian what you can get. You can only get the massive GFF. One expects that the only possible limit is the massive GFF. And this is not. This is not included in this theorem per se. Why? Because here I'm saying it's a Gaussian process, but I'm not telling you what is the covariance of this process. So if you want to be proving that it's a massive GFF, you would need to be proving something like properly renormalizing the S. So if, I mean, finding the right delta of A and looking at S2A x1, x2, which would be something like the spin-spin correlation of your easing model. You should prove that this converges as a tends to 0 to something. And it, ideally, you want here the massive continuous gain function. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. We have very strong indication. I mean, at the time, I had zero clue how to do it, absolutely zero clue. So it's a very, really different uh, question in some sense. Recently, with one of my PhD students, we progressed a lot. I mean, it's definitely too far to, uh, uh, to be uh, statable as a, as a theorem. Maybe I should have chosen to do this class next year. <laughs> but, uh, but I think there is a chance to get that it's only massive GFF that you can get. But, um, I wanted just to mention it. Um, tenth comment, in fact, I have, yeah. In dimension two, a 
And this I will maybe even have time. I don't, uh, we are going to see. Maybe I will have time to even present it. You are not Gaussian. The limit is non-Gaussian. This is something which is fairly easy to see from conformal invariance. So if you know conformal invariance, you can actually quickly see that you get a non-Gaussian field for the spin field. But there is actually a very soft argument that gives you the non-triviality, the non which basically is going to prove something like the second, the fourth moment of your random variable TFL is not three times the second, the second moment squared. So I will try probably to, uh, to prove it uh, at some point. And let me mention that in dimension three, it is expected not to be Gaussian, not to be. But it's not known for the easing model. So there is a, a, a nice paper of, uh, by Slava Rishkov and his co-authors where they even quantify, in some sense, how non-Gaussian it is by looking at the Ursel four-point function. We will get to this quantity, maybe not today, but next week. Uh, but there is no rigorous proof at the, at the discrete level that, indeed, you get something non-Gaussian. And I should say that this resonates the fact that it's expected to be non-Gaussian and that it's non-Gaussian here, with the 11th comment and last comment, which is that phi, I mean, phi for two and phi for three, so the, the 2D and 3D, uh, phi for models, really the continuum one, have been constructed, constructed rigorously and have been proved to be non-trivial. Non, non so you will tell me, well, it's, it's a little bit strange. You are telling me that you are just expecting it's non-Gaussian for easing. And you tell me, oh, but you know how to prove the limit. But this is not made, these constructions are not based on the lattice cutoff. They are based on other construction, like Fourier cutoff or things like that. So this is why, I mean, it doesn't rule out that what you would get from easing would be trivial if, of course, nobody expects that. Everybody expects that whatever, I mean, everybody. I expect that whatever uh, a reasonable cutoff you, you apply, you will end up with the same object in the limit. So in dimension two and three, it's already done. So, so you mentioned two is the same. The, the limit and what is constructed is. <coughs> um, you mean here and here, like what you can get from, uh, yeah, you should end up with the same. So of course there it's always a little bit, when people mean that they are constructed, sometimes they only mean that in some sense they have the local limit of the thing, but they don't always have access to the long range uh, so once you have phi 4, you can rescale then and try to see how the correlations behave when you look at large scale properties of this phi 4. So there, the large scale properties of this phi 4 should be related when you take a critical continuum phi 4 to what you get by taking the scaling limit of the spin field at criticality, uh, where there you get this critical easing model, this conformal invariant. This phi 4, it's not necessarily a conformally invariant object. It's not necessarily an object at criticality in some sense. It, ca it can have a, a correlation length. The massive Gaussian free field has a correlation length, which is m. Like correlations decay exponentially fast. I mean, one over m. Okay. So it's a, even if there is a passage to the limit, you have to be careful that you don't necessarily end up. The limiting object is not necessarily a scale invariant type object. You have to. But if you take it at, criti uh, uh, as a, at, at the right parameters, then it's going to be the large scale properties are going to be related to the critical easing. I think I completely messed with your brain right now. But it's yeah. also, it, it makes me think that in four dimensions, 5 4 could be non trivial, but at large scale, it could be Gaussian like easing. Thanks, thank you. Uh, 
No, uh, I mean, it's just, it's always trivial at every scale. Uh, it's always Gaussian at every scale. There is no, uh, yeah. Whatever the scale of your TFL, uh, it, you, you will end up, whatever the scale of F, it will be Gaussian, whatever F. Okay. Okay, so now we pass to the second part of of the class, and it's going to look much more like uh, a math course. So I know I, I saw some physicists uh, yesterday that kind of panicked and said, "Oh, I hope it's not going to be too difficult." Don't worry, I'm doing only easy math. Um, so I'm going to try to be like uh, self-contained, and I think it's actually a subject that fits pretty well to be self-contained. It's almost combinatorics, you are going to see. And so the, the tool I'm going to develop, it's called the random current representation of the easing model. And I should right away try to be a good advertiser and says that this random current representation, it's actually useful way beyond just trying to prove triviality. It's a very useful tool to study the easing model where we are, are going to see you, you kind of rewrite the spin-spin correlation of the easing model in terms of either kind of random walk probabilities or percolation probabilities. You will, I will explain these things, and you will see we will manipulate. I will actually try to give you some ap direct applications of these things that you see that it's useful. And it appears more and more in, uh, in the most refined results on easing model that people use this random current representation. OK, so what is it? So definition or basics, basic notions. As often in math, you start by a completely trivial definition, and hopefully you get to something good. So a current on a graph G, let's say it has set of vertices V and set of edges E, is oh well a current on G is a function is an element n belonging to the function from the non-negative integers I mean to the non-negative integers and starting from here the pairs the so unordered paired x, y included in v. So what you just do, you have your graph, for instance. Let's say it has four points. And for every pair, you give, so if this is x and y, you attribute a variable, n, x, y, which is just a non-negative integer. OK? And a priori, at this stage, you are also allowing any pair. Like there can be a non-negative integer for any pair. You are going to see we are going to quickly restrict a little bit that. But uh, this is a current, OK? You will understand a little bit maybe why we call it a current, even though if somebody understands, don't hesitate to tell me, because I'm not entirely certain why we call it like that. I see an analogy with electric current, but not much more than that. OK. So this current, there will be things I want to be considering on it. So I will say that a vertex x in v is a source of n if the following quantity, delta n of x, uh, delta x of n, sorry, which is just the sum of a y of n x y. Right, I will always write them like that. So this will be n x y for x and y 
in V. Okay? So if this thing is odd, this is an integer, it's either odd or even, I would call it a source if it's odd. Uh, yeah. Sorry? Are the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you really look at unordered. So the notation is a little bit confusing here, but this is the same as NYX. There is only one object, which is N. I, I should write to be fully rigorous, but you are going to see we are going to use this notation a lot, so I try to make a concise one, but this will be a much better and much more trustful uh, notation. Okay. So I mean. I will use this one. So if it's odd, and let partial n be the set of sources of n. So that's the second notion. And the last notion associated to a current will be its weight. So the weight w beta of n of a current would just be the product of a xy of beta jxy to the nxy divided by nxy factorial. You are going to see it appears very naturally. I mean, we are going to, now I'm going to prove things, right? So, I mean, uh, hopefully I will manage to, to give you an idea of why these things emerge or you will see it from the proof that it's natural. So what is going to be the game? The game is going to be that we are going to express the quantities of the Ising model in terms of weighted sums of currents. Okay? And one thing that you immediately see is that if jxy is 0, so if jxy equals 0, then nxy, if you want to have a non-zero weight for w, what do you need? You need nxy to be 0. nxy equals 0, otherwise uh, w beta of n equals 0. Why do I say that? Because it's very natural to consider that g as a, for now I just use v, right? There was no mention, so g is a graph, but I only mention the set of vertices. So it's very natural, in fact, to just set the set of edges as being the set of pairs where jxy is non-zero. Okay, so we will always, for this reason, we always set the set of edges of g to be, so I will call it e, to be the set of xy such that jxy is strictly positive. In fact, it's not zero, but we will always look at strictly positive. So with this notation, then the current is what? It's just a function from the edges of your graph into z plus. Okay? So then that gives you and that's what I want you to remember. But sometimes, if you see, if you are looking at long-range models, I mean, you don't really want to be saying that you are working on the complete graph, even though it's kind of what you are doing, because every pair x, y has an edge between them. But because we will be working mostly with nearest neighbor, this is actually a good thing. And so then is an n is an element of z plus to the power e. So it's a function from the edges of your graph to the non-zero, uh, the, the, the non-negative integers. We are going to manipulate this thing a lot, so don't hesitate to ask me if something is unclear, because otherwise it's going to be a long, long time for you. <laughs> okay. So we are going to do something which is similar to what people, I mean, maybe many people in the room already saw. Maybe you heard about the low and the high temperature expansions 
of the Ising model. So here we are going to do something very similar to the high temperature expansion. So imagine I look at so set sigma a. This will be practical. So it's by definition the product of the spin in a set A. And let's look at Z A G beta, which by definition I set it to be the sum for sigma of sigma A exponential of minus beta edge of sigma. So this is if A is the empty set, I end up with the partition function of the Ising model, the normalization that you have in the definition. And here I'm just, the A is when I multiply by sigma A. Okay, and what I claim is that this is equal to two to the number of vertices sum for currents such that the set of sources is A of W beta of N. So I can rewrite this quantity like that. So in particular, if I look at the correlations sigma between the points, the spins in sigma in A, sorry, then this is Z A G beta of a Z empty set G beta. And so this is just a sum of W beta of n when I sum on currents without, uh, with sources A over the sum of W beta of n when I, I sum on sourceless currents. I mean, you understood, and I think you will agree with me, that except if really we are facing something weird, we would just remove this when we are talking about n. It will always be a sum of occurrence. So you can express the spin-spin correlations, for instance, for instance, sigma x, sigma y, which would be a equal xy, with only two elements x and y. Then you can express it as a ratio of weighted sums over currents. It's just that I attract your attention on the fact that these currents have different set of sources depending on whether you are on the numerator or denominator. Okay, so let's try to prove this proposition. And uh, maybe after that we do a small break. Okay, so proof of this thing. So what you do is, is very simple. You are going to use that exponential of jxy sigma x sigma y, which is something that appears in this, this thing. I'm going to just expand it and say this is a sum from nxy equals 0 to infinity of, NX, uh, of uh, jxy sigma x sigma y to the nxy divided by an xy factorial. Okay, I just tell or expand like that. So if I do that and I start from this thing, here I can write it as a e to the beta sigma x sigma, I mean jxy sigma x sigma y. Okay, this is exactly this thing. I expand. So I end up with something like that. And here I can try to just invert the two sums. And I'm going to end up with what? I'm going to end up with a sum of all possible n. Then there will be things that do not depend on sigma. So there will be a product of xy of jxy beta to the nxy over nxy factorial. 
these are these terms. And then I have terms that depend on sigma. So I have a sum of a sigma. I have a sigma a. And I have a product of a x. And let's see for each x how many times sigma x appears. Well, it appears for every pair xy. It appears n xy times. So I'm going to get delta x of n. That's exactly the number of times things appear. And maybe a smarter way of writing that is to say plus indicator function that x belongs to a. Just another way of putting it. I just, sigma a is a product of the uh, sigma x for x in a, and I just put it like that. So now what is the observation? First, an easy one. If, so if I look at this quantity, if this quantity is even for every x, then, I mean, sigma x is valued plus minus 1, so this thing would be 1. So I'm just summing 1, so I get 2 to the number of vertices. On the other hand, if not, then that means what? That means that there is at least somewhere one vertex for which this is odd. But each configuration sigma, so let's call it x0, this, this vertex. Each configuration sigma can be associated to another configuration, sigma x0, which is the same configuration except you switch the spin at x0. So, in this case, what you see is that sigma and sigma x0, well, they just have opposite con contribution to this sum. Therefore, you get 0. So if not, then 0. Because there is this involution that switches the state of, uh, of spin. Notice that this is actually a deep, I mean, it looks quite simple. But it's a deep uh, kind of manifestation of the plus-minus symmetry in the spin space. The fact that there is this plus-minus symmetry for easing. That every configuration sigma, so because here you, you, you associate sigma and sigma x0, where this is spin at x0 is switch. I should write even smaller, but I mean that's all. okay. Sorry. Okay. So overall, what do I get? This is W beta of n, and here this is two to the number of vertices indicator function that the source of n is a because having this which is even for every x exactly means this even for every x not in a and this odd for every x in a. So I get exactly what I want. OK. Two comments, and we make a break. I don't know how many people heard about the high temperature expansion. But the high temperature expansion is something where each edge is associated to just a random variable, which is 0 or 1, either you have an edge or not in the high temperature expansion. Where the high temperature expansion is just the set of odd edges of this thing is a set of odd, uh, odd currents, sorry, uh, of, ed of edges having odd currents. 
So it's, it's very easy to read the high temperature expansion from the random current representation. At this stage, it's not that obvious why the random current representation is better than the high temperature expansion for those who know what the high temperature expansion is. But it will become very clear, I think, actually during the second class, I mean, during the second hour, the next hour, that there is an additional tool that you get when you work with the random current and that this is a very powerful one. That the first comment, the second comment is that, just to give you a little bit of history, so it, it appeared in the work of Griffiths, But it was, I think it's fair to say that it was magnified, like really used it in its full power in the work of Eisenman from uh, 1980. But it was uh, used uh, to, uh, I mean, at the next level of sophistic sophistication. by Eisenman exactly in the work on triviality. This is the end of 2.1. In 2.2, I'm going to give you, explain to you how you can kind of see a random walk type object in the random current. And then in 2.3, we will do what we call the switching lemma, which is a little bit our fundamental lemma uh, uh, in, in, uh, in random current, even though you should not use fundamental lemma here. Uh, why not being careful, but anyway. Uh, okay, so let's make a 10 minute break and uh, we resume in 10 minutes. As I said, the game now, is it good for some? Yeah. Okay, so the game now is to give you two interpretations of the random current one in terms of objects that look a little bit like random path, and one which is closer to what we do in percolation theory. So I'm going to start with a random walk interpretation of currents. And the idea as a starting observation is that if you take n, and let's say you assume there are no sources in n, then it's fairly easy to understand that n can be seen as the occupation time of a family of loops. So what do I mean by that? I mean that I look at a family of, a family of loops, not even necessarily self-avoiding. The loops can pass by several times the same uh, edge. And I just count the total number of times the loops pass through each edge. This gives me an integer. Well, n, if there are no sources, can be seen as the occupation time of a family of loops. I'm not saying that there is a canonical way of decomposing n into loops, but what I'm saying is that there is a way. And one easy way to see is that what you can do is you start from n, you take a vertex where Delta x of n is non-zero, so there is at least one non-zero current nearby. And I just step on this current, on this edge, and remove one to the edge, because I pass through it, so I remove one. Now I arrive at a vertex, and you will agree with me that this vertex has necessary an, is now a source of the new current because I remove one and before it had an even degree here, so now it's odd. So necessarily I can keep going. There's necessarily an edge which has, odd, uh, which has a positive current. I can take it, I remove one, 
and I keep going like that. The only time where I will possibly be blocked if, if I end up, if I step on the place where I have odd current before I step. What is the only place that is like that? It's the place where I started from. Because after the first step, it had odd current. So I, like that, I drew one loop. I ended, up, I ended up with a new current which is smaller than before. And when I finish this loop, there is no source anymore. I, I, in, I created two sources by start. So I mean, I have this thing like that. I started from here. I started, if you want, erasing edges. So at a certain step, I have two sources. But at the end of my drawing, I, the two sources collide, and I don't, do not have sources anymore. So I can just iterate. I take another point where I have positive delta x of n, and I keep going. It's not at all canonical, but it works. Now, if I look not at that, but I take a set of sources A, notice, by the way, that A must be even. This is something that you can immediately see from the definition. Then it can be seen as the occupation time of a family of loops plus path pairing the vertices of A. Plus path pairing the vertices of A. So if this is a source, then in fact, if you start the peeling process, this blue process from this vertex, then as soon as you do one step, so now the sources are there, but there is no source here anymore. So this process necessarily must finish in one of the other sources. And then you take another source, you do the thing. So we are going to just, so there is nothing canonical here. I didn't tell you you should be decomposing like that. There is not a unique way of decomposing. So I'm going to just define one way to do it, because it will be useful for us first as an intuition and also in some of the results. So we will call it the backbone. And in fact, this backbone is actually related to what Frölich did and not Michael Eisenman for trivialities, but uh, I will mention it later on. So what you do is just you index vertices of ZD. OK? You pick the smallest, the smallest source. OK, so I have, like, say, four sources. Since vertices are indexed, there is a smallest source. You index them really as you want. There is no, uh, no big thing. And then what you do is that at each step, so let's say you constructed, so let's say you uh, pick a, the smallest source and call it gamma 0. So it's the first step of a walk that I'm going to construct. And at each step, if you constructed gamma 0 up to gamma t, what you do is that you pick I mean, let's say, either gamma t is not a source of the original n. So either you, you are somewhere there. And if you are there, what you do is that you look around you and you take the smallest edge, which has odd current. OK? Oh, by the way, I'm on ZD. Vertices on ZD. So I take the smallest, so pick Uh, 
and call gamma t plus 1 the other extremity. The, sm uh, the smallest edge incident to gamma t, of course. Incident to gamma t and not already used. Let me rewrite this properly. The smallest edge incident to gamma t, not already used, uh, of odd current. And call gamma t plus 1, the other extremity. So why can I always do that? I start from a source. I have an even number of edges around me, and I have a, I'm a source. As a delta x of n is odd. So necessarily, one of the edges around me is odd, has an odd current. So I can go. But now I'm at the vertex, and if I was not a source of n, I have delta x of n, which is even. But I just use an odd edge. So the remaining sum of currents is odd. So I can pick one which is odd, and I work on it. And I do that, I do that. The only time where I'm not certain is that maybe gamma t ends up being a source. Maybe I'm now here. If gamma t is a source, then pick the smallest source left and jump there. And keep going. So just a simple thing, if I arrive here, then I pick the smallest or the one, and I restart from there. OK? So the outcome of this is a collection, so gamma, t, gamma at the very end. So of course, at some point, it stops because there is no source left. And you get a collection of cardinal of A over 2 paths that are pairing the uh, vertices in A. That's the definition of your background. OK, so I'm going to associate exactly like for currents, I associated a weight. Let me associate a weight to backbones. So definition, so it's 2.5 weight for backbone. So, I'm, so for gamma, I call rho s of gamma for gamma and uh, for, for s subset of zd and gamma from x to, I mean, and gamma. I'm going to call rho s of gamma. So the, the definition. So let me try to check how I want it to be. Yeah. So definition. So I'm going to put the partition function of the easing model on S. And I'm going to do the following. So you are going to see this is a little bit strange. But I hope to be able to uh, explain to you what this is. So I do the following. Define gamma bar. So what is gamma bar? Gamma bar is going to be gamma, so my, my path gamma, plus a certain number of edges. And these edges will be the following. It will be all the edges. So 
all the edges that are smallest, I mean, that are smaller. So let me make a drawing, maybe. So when I do the process of, exp I mean, it's, it's really a pain to define uh, rigorously, so I'm going to make a good drawing. So let's say this is gamma s. This is gamma s plus 1. And this is gamma s plus 2. When I did this process here, and that I decide that my next step here is this edge. In fact, I get some information on the parity of the current on certain edges. Why? Imagine that this edge and this edge have a smaller index than this one. So meaning that these vertices here had a smaller index than this guy. If this is the next step of my current, of my backbone, what does it tell me? It tells me that these two edges have even current. Otherwise, this would not be the edge. If this was odd, because this is a smaller index, this would be the edge. Same thing for here. So when you, if you want, if you think probabilistically or physically, when you explore your backbone, you gather two types of information. The first one is that you gather that you are odd on the backbone. But you also gather the information that on those type of edges, you are even. So these edges, I will call so gamma bar is a union. I mean, it's all the edges whose parity is fixed by the event gamma of n equal gamma. So when I'm telling you the backbone of your current is equal to gamma, here I'm fixing the, I'm forcing the parity of a certain number of edges, clearly the edges on gamma, but also some edges outside that must be even. And now you kind of understand what this weight is saying. It's saying the edges on gamma should be odd. The edges on the other guys that are fixed, sorry, should be even. And this is a natural sum, uh, this is a natural ratio for the following thing, so the following uh, reason. Oh, page 16 disappeared. Ah, no. Okay. Yeah, I have never been very good at hide and seek. <laughs> Uh, 16. So why is this weight natural? Because it satisfies the following three properties. And you are going to see it's not that, these are not that difficult properties to derive. So proposition. It's 2.6. So the weight has the following properties. So assume gamma 1, I mean, oh, set gamma 1 circle gamma 2 for the concatenation of two, of, of two, of two uh, walks. OK, imagine you have a first walk. This is gamma 1. And you just concatenate the next one, if you can. Notice that gamma 1 is an edge-avoiding walk. It's not allowed to go back to the same edge. So if you can, you call these two, so, so set for the concatenation. Of gamma 1 and gamma 2, when they can be concatenated in such a way that the concatenation is a backbone, is a potential backbone, sorry, in such a way that gamma 1, gamma 2 can be a backbone. So of course, one condition, for instance, is that they should not intersect. 
But it's not just that. I mean, it should also, gamma 2 should not be allowed to use one of the edges of gamma 1 bar, for instance, because this is forced to be even, so it couldn't be odd a posteriori. But they are clearly works that you can concatenate. And the first property is saying that if I look at the weight of gamma 1 concatenated with gamma 2, it's equal to the weight of gamma 1 times the weight of gamma 2, uh, of gamma 1, of, yeah, of gamma 2, sorry, but in S minus gamma 1. And in fact, minus gamma 1 bar. So you have a chain rule like that. And this is one of the reasons why you want to set the definition of the weights like that. Second property is that sigma A uh, S beta is just the sum of sigma X, sigma Y, let's say, or sigma A. It's just the sum for gamma uh, pairing the elements of A of rho S of gamma. So the spin-spin correlation can be written as a sum of the weight of these backbones. And the third property, I'm going to write it here just to avoid splitting, is that if S is included in T, then the weight of a backbone is larger in S than in T. So the smaller the S, the larger the weight of the backbone. So why did I mention this? I mean, first, because we are going to use it next week, but also because I wanted to draw an analogy with another model of statistical physics, which is called the safe avoiding walk. Yes, yeah. Yeah, like it's this thing constructed like that. Just one but I, in fact, if you decide of another recipe to identify a collection of paths that would pair the, if you do it in a non-crazy way, you will also be able to define the backbone there. Probably the gamma bar is going to be a little bit different, for instance. See, the definition of gamma bar could change. Maybe if you take something at random, there should be there an average of a weight, like say, you know, you choose uniformly among all the odd edges that are uh, possible, for instance. You have different ways of defin defining backbones. They will all basically share the same properties if you do it properly. Okay? okay. So here I chose it like that. So you, you first index the vertices and then you change yeah. the backbone? Yeah. You, you change the index? You change the backbone, you are right. So, when, so there when you say T and S are backbones, you mean with different index? No, no, gamma is the same backbone. Ah, gamma, gamma. It's just the, the underlying graph. So the weight of a backbone depends on the graph on which, on the set of vertices. So you have a set of vertices here. S, and you have a pass, and you are estimating, you are defining the weight of this pass with respect to this set. Okay? Okay. And, uh, yeah? Okay, well, so when you say gamma, uh, circle gamma 2 can be a backbone, you mean this can be constructed in that way? Ah, it's just that imagine that I take two paths, gamma 1 and gamma 2, and let's say gamma 2 uses a, a pa, a, an edge of gamma 1, that they intersect on one edge. Then it's impossible that gamma 1 and gamma 2 can be concatenated in such a way that it could be obtained as a backbone of a certain current. Okay, but, uh, yeah. of, a current. of a certain current, yeah. Okay. Yeah, notice that the weight of here, the weight of the path gamma, Gamma here is not the backbone of a given current. It's I give you a path, and I attribute the weight, and this is going to be related to 
uh, whether it can be, the, I mean, it is the, the backbone of, of a current. But there, it's a path of, ah, weight of a backbone. Yes, I understand now maybe the confusion. I should not have called it like that, let's say. Weight of a path, and then we are going to relate it to the backbone. That's maybe, maybe this, this is confusing indeed. OK. Maybe I'm going to try to keep the backbone definition here. Let me give you a proof of this proposition. Oh, yes, I was saying analogy to self forwarding walks. self forwarding walks, so let's say edge self forwarding walks, are path going from one point to another one that never use the same edge. And in this model, there is a very natural weight that you want to attribute to each self forwarding walk. It's x to the number of just edges in your walk. Okay? If you think of this as the weight of your walk, it will exactly satisfy this property because here it will say the weight of the concatenation of two walks is going to be indeed, so it's going to be x to the gamma 1 plus gamma 2, which is exactly the product of the two. In some sense, it doesn't even depend on s. And this is going to be an equality because it doesn't depend on s. It's just x to the number of edges. And here, it will be more the correlation of your self forwarding walk is the sum of the weight, which is, in fact, in this case, just the definition of the self forwarding walk. So this backbone, you can think of it as a kind of a little bit more complex version of self forwarding walks, where the weight is a little bit more weird, but where we are lucky enough that we manage to get properties that are, in fact, kind of the important properties when you study self forwarding walks. If you have those properties, you are in good shape. So what I'm claiming in this proposition is that the weights really satisfy exactly what you want. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, no, no, no. Uh, so I was hoping at some point that this would be implied by uh, the notion of the weight, but it isn't. So you are right. That's a good point. Okay. Yeah. Let's include it in S like that. We are, um, that's a very good point. Okay. So for one. So first property. Why do we have this ratio here? Well, if you look upstairs, I'm going to do the proof of a lazy man. This part of the weight, it's actually factorizing perfectly, in fact. It's defined in such a way the compatibility makes it that these things, the gamma 1 and gamma 1 bar are actually, I mean, gamma 1 bar is disjoint from gamma 2 bar, and that's exactly what the, the, the thing does, and therefore it factorizes. And here, when you notice that the chain rule is exactly giving you what you want there, so rho s gamma 1, gamma 2, so you are exactly going to say that this is uh, Z empty set S minus gamma 1, gamma 2 bar over Z empty set S times the thing that factorizes. And here what you can do is just divide and multiply by gamma 1 bar. If you do things carefully, you exactly end up with what you want. OK? So it's just something of dividing and multiplying by the right thing. It's really not deep. So let's call it obvious. Uh, so if you do it carefully, it works. Okay. Second property, and this is a link to the backbone, and that's why uh, I usually, we usually call it the weight of a backbone, but I mean, a priori, it's the weight of a path. 
uh, is that the second property is just due So if, so, okay, let's call it like that. Sigma A, it's the sum of a possible gamma uh, pairing vertices in A of what? of the sum for n equal a of w beta of n indicator that gamma of n equal gamma divided by some sourceless w beta of n. Okay? And when you take gamma which goes, which is really pairing the vertices of a, this is in fact just rho of gamma, rho s of gamma. It's not very difficult to see. So this whole thing here is rho s of gamma. OK. And the third thing is even kind of simpler. So oh, no, well, it's not simpler, simpler, actually. I don't know why I said that. So rho s of gamma over rho t of gamma, what do I get? This factorizes, and I just end up with the ratio of those things. So I end up with the empty set of uh, S minus gamma bar over the empty set of S times the empty set of T over the empty set of T minus gamma bar. OK? OK, and so you want to be proving that this is larger or equal to 1. OK? Well, this is due to one very simple observation, but I mean, a powerful one. How can I rewrite this thing? So I'm looking at the ratio of two partition functions of easing. So I have t, and I'm removing the set gamma bar. What I can think of is that, imagine here, I can think of this thing as just, OK, let, let me maybe write somewhere else here. So So I can see it like that. This is almost the partition function of the easing model on T with zero copy constants on edges here. When I remove a set here, it's like I'm setting the edges to zero copying constant. And I'm forgetting that they are isolated vertices. But if I re-put these isolated vertices, I end up with just the partition function of the easing model with zero coupling constant on the edges of gamma bar. So here, if I just multiply by 2 to the number of vertices in, uh, uh, I mean, outside T, I mean, in gamma bar, but I mean, endpoint of gamma bar, which are not in T. Uh, no, sorry, endpoint of edges in gamma bar which are uh, not in gamma bar, not outside gamma bar. I end up with, I'm going to write it like that. I should never have proved this thing, I realize. 
this is how you discourage a whole crowd. But I mean, so it's this thing can be understood as the easing model on T, where I define coupling constant J, where J x y is J x y. I mean, is zero if x y is an edge of uh, of gamma bar and J x y otherwise. So here I really didn't do anything smart. I just said, of in fact, my easing model on my smaller set, I can see it as an easing model on the big set with zero copy constants. It's just that there is this stupid thing that isolated vertices, they have two possible spins. So there is a factor two to the number of those vertices that you need to add. But why is it good to do it like that? Because now the empty set of T is what? So the partition function on T. Well, an easing model on T with coupling constant J, I can see it as an easing model with zero coupling constant when I'm looking at E to the beta blah blah uh, product of, uh, of the remaining edges of E to the beta blah blah. So this, I can see it as correlation in my easing model with coupling constant J bar of product for x, y in gamma bar of E to the beta sigma x sigma y. This exactly gives me this quantity divided by this. So why did I do that? Because this is a quantity which is increasing in t. This is just a sum over like a certain possible set of, uh, let's call it uh, u of, of vertices of alpha u times sigma u. Tj, and we will see so clearly not this uh, this but next week that correlations are increasing in the graph. So instead of having t, if you have s, if s is smaller than t, then this is going to be larger than the thing for s. So this is going to be larger. I mean, this is going to be increasing in t, and so here, this is going to be larger than this one over this. So I'm going to get larger or equal to one. I wanted, I mean, you see, it's, it's typically, I did something wrong. It's typically this thing that you struggle to understand and that you absolutely want to convey to other people. And then you realize that you didn't do a better job than the person who explained it to you the first time. So it, it's a trick which is very useful. Remember, for people who had to work with this type of, of model where you have what we call Griffiths inequality, that this type of ratios they are decreasing in the graph. So this type of ratio are increasing in the graph. So this one are decreasing. Okay. And just a funny thing, you, you, could, you could think, but why did he define this weird model with jx y equals zero? Why did he, didn't he look at this thing, which there you can clearly see it as an easing model with normal coupling constant on S, and you are just averaging not product of e to the beta sigma x sigma y, but product of minus beta sigma x sigma y. So it looks like a much more natural thing to do. Except that when you expand this thing, the alpha u have no reason to be positive, and it's absolutely unclear whether this is decreasing in s or not. So kind of doing it the other way allows you to have this special form where things are positive, and this, these quantities they appear everywhere. They are really, really useful. So it's kind of very funny that when you do it the wrong way, you absolutely don't see any monotonicity popping up. But when you do it in the right way, it comes fairly easily. OK. So that was the, the, the bottom line of the story here is that remember that in some sense, in a current, With sources A, there is there are kind of hidden safe avoiding walks pairing the vertices. And these hidden safe avoiding walks, they have weights which really behave a little bit similar to safe avoiding walks. 
So what is going to be now the next step? The next step is that we are going to want to interpret spin-spin uh, correlations. And in particular, for instance, let's say you take the four-point function and you want to compare to what you would get if it was a Gaussian process. So you want to compare to Vick's law. Well, we are going to try to prove that the difference between the four-point function and what you get from Vick's law can be expressed in terms of intersection of those random walks. You have four points, so you have pairings of walks. You have two walks that are pairing the thing. And we are going to try to interpret this as, OK, do they intersect or not? In order to do that, well, we have to go through exactly what is the juice of the random current, which is when you look at two currents. So I'm just going to state the lemma. I will prove it next week. So I, I'm, I'm going to talk about duplicated current. I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm going to state what we call the switching lemma. And then just in the five last minutes, I'm going to give you a few applications and maybe a few exercises for next week just uh, to, to, to train with that. So 2.3, duplicated current. OK. In fact, it's a big word just to say that from now on, we will work with multiple currents. And one thing that we would like is we would like to get rid of a very annoying property of the expression of spin-spin correlation in terms of currents, which is that you have a ratio to weighted sums, but on completely different currents. At the top, it's currents with sources A. At the bottom, it's sources currents. So as a probabilist, this is very annoying. You would like to be having the same type of object on top and bottom, and just saying the guys on top satisfy a certain property. Because like that, you could say, well, it's a probability that for my, say, sourceless current, something happens. The problem is that we are not facing that here. So the following lemma is exactly going to, it's exactly going to go around the difficulty. I mean, it's, it's going to allow us to, to play with the currents, with the sources. So it's called the switching lemma. And it says the following. So consider H included in G, two graphs. OK, so you have a first graph, G, and you have a certain subgraph, H. Then, and let's say you take a function F, which goes, which take currents on G and gives you, so on edges of G, and gives you a real number, say. OK? So the switching lemma tells you the following. Let's assume that I take two sums, a sum on n1, which is a current on g, which has sources, say, a, OK? w beta n1. But let the, let's say that I take a double sum. I also take n2, which is this time a current on h. By the way, you can think h equal g if you prefer. I'm writing it like that. That's because it, it is interesting to have this generalization. But otherwise, just think you have. I'm summing on pairs of currents in one, one in h, one in, in g. And I'm looking at a functional of the sum of the two. OK? Well, the switching lemma tells me what I'm allowed to do is I can switch the sources I can put the sources of the second current 
on the first one. So if I put the sources of the second on the first one, I mean that now I have empty set on the second, and I have sources A symmetric difference with B in the first one. Well, what I claim is that here I can keep n1 plus n2. By the way, notice what is the set of sources of n1 plus n2. If n1 has sources A and n2 has sources B, the, the sum of the two has the set of, I mean, the symmetric difference as a set of sources. Oh, for the physicist, sorry, should have said that. This is the symmetric difference between the two sets. Okay? I have W beta n1, W beta n2. So here it looks like uh, absolutely marvelous because it looks like just I'm allowed to switch sources from one to the other. In fact, this is not true, but what I have to add is fairly easy. I need to add the indicator function that n1 plus n2 belongs to fb, where I need to tell you what fb is, where fb is the set of n such that there exists a k, a k smaller or equal to n with the sources of k equal b. So I need to be able to find a current smaller than n1 plus n2, which is pairing the sources in the thing. So in particular, for instance, if b is just x, y, like just two points, fb is what? Is I should find a current smaller than n1 plus n2, which has sources x and y. So this is exactly equivalent to say that there is a path of positive current between x and y. I will redo this type of things next week, don't worry. But rather than, so I'm definitely not going to prove this now. And I will maybe not even discuss it too much, what it is. I just want in the five last minutes to just show to you a bunch of application of that, like really direct applications that I will redo quietly next week. But just to tell you that once you have that, really many things just follow very easily. So for instance, imagine, so applications. Let's say I look at sigma a squared. Sigma a squared is what? So it's the square of the spin-spin correlation. So it's z a z a over z empty set, z empty set, right? So it is the sum if I have n1 and n2 with sources a divided by the sum if I have no sources of WN1, let me put it, so W beta N1, W beta N2, and same thing at the bottom. Right? But what does the switching lemma tell me? The switching lemma tells me I'm allowed to switch the sources of the second guy to the first one. But if I do, do that, I'm, get, I'm getting empty set for the first one, but also for the second one. So here, I'm replacing by exactly the same object as downstairs. The only thing that I get is indicator function that n1 plus n2 belongs to fa. So what did I do? I re now I have that the square of spin-spin correlation, I can interpret it as the probability of a certain event, in this case, FA for a measure which consists in sampling two currents which are sourceless and just the probability of each one of the current is proportional to W beta of N1. So I get back on my feet as a probabilist, I get back uh, to, to, a probab to a probability event. I will really discuss that much more next week, don't worry. I mean, I'm, I just want to make some advertisement. Yeah? No, yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, don't worry, I will, I will definitely discuss it more. I will even define 
properly what are the probability measures I'm considering because we are going to like, use that a lot to prove our theorem. Imagine I did the same with the product of two spin-spin correlations, like that. So it's exactly the same. Now n1 has sources A and n2 has sources B. n1 and n2 here don't have sources. And again, so I, I don't put the W, but and again I'm allowed to switch like that. The cost is that I should add indicate a function of n1 plus n2 belongs to fb. But notice one thing. I mean, an indicator function is just reducing my sum. So if I forget entirely about this, I get that this is smaller we call. Now n2 has no sources at the bottom and top, so I can just remove n2. And I get just sum with n1 with sources A symmetric difference B, and the so sum with n1 is empty set. And this is just sigma A, sigma B. This is what we call Griffith inequality. And it comes completely immediately. By the way, you can check, for instance, that if I take age included in G, just apply, you can try it as, a, as an exercise before next time. I will redo it. But sigma A H is going to be smaller than sigma A G. You get automatically that spin-spin correlations are increasing in the graph. A little bit more difficult, for instance, if you have a set S and a point zero in it, I just recommend that you try to prove what we call, so this is, uh, yeah, what we call simon lieb inequality, which, which again I will re-explain next week, simon lieb inequality, and which says the following, that sigma 0, sigma y is smaller than the sum of x on the boundary of s, sigma 0, sigma x, s, sigma x, sigma y. Again, this is kind of an almost immediate application of the switching lemma. And the last mention I wanted to do, again, I will re-explain all these things. But the last mention, and like that, at least you have a take-home message for people who don't plan on coming back next time, or cannot come back next time. If you look at u4 x1 x4, which is just the correlation between four points minus the sum of the pairings. So let me even, so sigma x1, sigma x2, sigma x3, sigma x4, minus the two other permutation. So this is, well, let me write them actually. So u4 would be something which is 0 if you are looking at something Gaussian, if you have the weak law. Well, this thing I recommend as an exercise to try to prove that this is minus 2 sigma x1, sigma x2, sigma x3, sigma x4 times the sum I mean, yeah, let's put it like that. Sum of uh, all currents where the first current has sources x1, x4, and the second current has no sources. And at the top, the same thing. Indicator that x1 up to x4 are all connected. in n1 plus n2, meaning that you can go from any two point, I mean, to any point to any other using only edges of positive current. So why is this interesting? Because this is kind of the probability if I take one current with four sources and a second sourceless current, 
is the probability that I manage to connect the four points. So because there are sources, you know that the first current necessarily have passed between the two, the four vertices. There is even an additional current, which is kind of an additional collection of loops. Actually, even these things can do like that. And U4, compared to the spin-spin correlation of the four points, well, you compare it by looking at the probability that this thing is intersect or not. So you will be almost weak low if you can prove that the probability of intersection is very small. And now that just resonates with one theorem, one classical theorem about random walk, which is that in dimension five and more, and even in dimension four, in fact, in dimension four and more, if I take four points and I look at random walk going between these points, the probability that they intersect tends to zero. In dimension two and three, if they are at, uh, at a reasonable distance, in fact, they intersect with positive probability. So we see dimension four appearing in this random walk interpretation. And here we have a kind of safe avoiding walk interpretation that is going to play the role of the analogy with random walk. So this was just, I will re-explain all these applications, really, I will make the lines because I think all these things are non-trivial things. Simon Lieb inequality, if you don't have the random current, it's not straightforward to derive at all. But with the switching lemma, it's a very cool thing. And by the way, you can try to prove the switching lemma. It's a very cool combinatorial argument. It's, yeah, I will present it, I will present the proof next week. But I recommend that you try a little bit. And once we have all of that, we will be kind of ready to start proving our theorem. So our theorem will be, can we kind of prove that the safe, this, these backbones kind of behave like random walks in dimension four and more, basically. Okay, thank you very much and see you on Wednesday. <laughs>